How much drunk could a drunk monk drunk if a drunk monk could get drunk? All religions have characters, and some are more wild than others. Some are crazy, embarrassing, homeless, a little smelly. And Taiwanese folk religion has its own share of characters, like Jigong, a beloved, rampant, alcoholic god. <laughs> So you might be wondering, why would Taiwan worship an alcoholic god? So the story of Jigong starts around 800 years ago when Jigong was a Buddhist monk. And he lived in a monastery, but he didn't follow like any of the rules. Like he wore tattered, dirty clothing, he would eat meat, which Buddhists are really like, don't eat meat guys, that's bad. He'd drink a ton of alcohol. In general, people just didn't see him and see a monk. They saw kind of a crazy homeless drunk. The only difference between me and a homeless man is his job. I will do whatever it takes to survive. But he had a teacher at the monastery who'd always defend him. So when the monastery wanted to kick him out, they'd be like, this Jigong guy, man, he Buddhas so hard, which is true. He Buddhas so hard that he actually got supernatural powers. So Jigong would go out of his way to help the poor, the downtrodden, and didn't really care much about how the religious elite feel, which, if you know anything about history, tends to make them annoyed and murdery. So eventually, Jigong's teacher passes away, and the monastery kicks him out. And despite looking like a homeless person in tattered clothing and drinking all the time, he ends up still living the life of what people would think a monk should do. He cares for the poor, he heals the sick, he fights injustice. One of Jigong's most famous abilities is seeing the future and solving problems like a drunk would. For instance, one legend goes that that he prophesied that a village is gonna have a landslide. And if you live in Asia, landslides are like a way of life. Like you just see them all the time. There's mountains are like <laughs> So they're really dangerous. So Jigong pleads with the village and they actually end up confusing him as a homeless drunk, which kind of happens when you wear ratty clothes and have a giant word Buddha on your hat. Jigong, right? He also has the power of drinking thinking. So he sees a wedding procession and decides that the only way to get this village to really not die in a landslide is to kidnap the bride, throw her over his shoulder, and run. Bless your beautiful hide, wherever you may be. So he books it, and the whole village is like, we gotta chase this guy. And so they chase him out to commit some mob justice and maybe murder Jigong, and then the landslide happens, destroys the village, all of their homes, but nobody dies. And this is one example of Jigong's supernatural future-telling ability where he subverts expectations. People expect this drunken, terrible person to do stupid stuff, and he kind of does do stupid stuff, but in the end it works out and saves a lot of lives. And there's sort of innumerable legends you see about Jigong doing this. Eventually the historical Jigong died, and he went from Buddhist monk to Taoist deity. And about the 1800s, we see him become really popular in Taiwan. And we mean really popular. Like, if you were to look on the internet now, there's countless different movies and films and just stories of Jigong. He's a pop culture icon, basically, even though he's kind of like a drunk. I mean, like drunken master. We all know drunken master, right? So one thing people love about Jigong, though, is he's relatable. If you're a taxi driver who has some hard living or you're a blue collar worker or maybe you drink too much, you have this god who feels like someone you can relate to. Although Jigong doesn't make the same mistakes you do, he's generally like drinking, but he kind of comes out with a win at the end but it's someone who is down to earth. And with all these gods who are wearing these beautiful clothing and floating on lotuses, it's refreshing to have a god you can relate to. Don't listen to your critics, listen to your fans. So today, Jigong is a popular god for mediums to call upon, and they will possess the medium, the Jitong, like we talked about in our possession video. And when they possess them, that means that they live like Jigong. They drink insane amounts of alcohol. Some people would say inhuman amounts. Oh my God. <laughs> You are so drunk. Did you get that? <laughs> and interesting enough, some people even say that they don't drink unless they're possessed by Jigong. And they also kind of live this outrageous life of eating dog meat and weird stuff. I know, I know, that's crazy, but I guess that's... He didn't just eat meat, he ate dog meat. That, that's how crazy this guy. Buddha's hard, party's harder. So who in the Bible could we compare to someone like Jigong? Cold wind blows on the kingdom tonight. Christianity we see. A kingdom of comparing and contrasting, and it looks like I'm the queen. So the scriptures are full of characters, and some are like Samson, who actually has like superpowers and drinks all the time. Oh God, give me strength.
But really, that's not what Jigong is. At the heart of Jigong is someone who upsets religious rulers while looking rough on the edges. And he calls people back to the heart of compassion and justice that maybe their religion originally stood for. Not necessarily saying that's all Jigong does, that's just one of the things we see that really fits well with some characters through Christianity. Jigong subverts your expectations and he constantly reveals your heart by offending your senses. And there's one guy in scripture who's particularly good at this, who arrives after fulfilling a bunch of prophecies, John the Baptist. This man was wild. He covers himself with camel hair clothing, which is like really rough and scratchy. It's basically like having a Brillo pad to wear. And then he lived off of locusts and honey in the wilderness, which means that he's digging his hands into beehives. His clothing, which was probably scratchy and also a little bit gross, was actually symbolic of the office he had, a prophet. See, Elijah actually dressed the same way. Clearly, you are not a frothing madman, but every bit as unreasonable. Unlike Jigong, though, scripture says John didn't drink alcohol and he didn't even eat bread. He really loved those bugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not bad. He's pretty famous for being the cousin of Jesus, and his role was to prepare the way for the Messiah. You see, Israel had become pretty corrupt at this point in history. Religious leaders had started to add rules on rules on rules, and people started to believe that life was all about getting ahead. So John the Baptist arrives, and he's this amazing preacher and prophet. We only have snippets of what he said, but even today you can find a group called the Mandeans who worship him, and they have 70,000 people in the Middle East. His words have lasted 2,000 years because what he said was really impactful to a wide variety of people groups. And he gave tangible examples too. He tells tax collectors, for instance, stop skimming off the top, and soldiers, stop looting. It was hard for these people, it was a hard life. Sometimes they would take off the top because their own salary couldn't pay for their needs. But John says that's no excuse. Just because injustice happens to you doesn't mean that you commit injustice back. <laughs> So ultimately, he calls the nation of Israel to repent and to turn away from sin. And what's crazy is they listen. People flock to John the Baptist. And that's because he cuts to the heart of what Judaism was actually about. About living well, about loving others, about serving and worshiping a true and living God. But you could think because of that, that his words are light. But John actually spoke in Old Testament language. He'd be like threshing and winnowing and fork. But he's really intense. He called the Pharisees a brood of snakes, basically a snake nest. I always say the first thing that comes to my mind. Yes, I heard about that brood of vipers comment. That was classy. Do you know how the poets say vipers are born? Yes, they hatch inside their mothers and eat their way out, killing their mothers in the process. I thought it was a pretty good line. He spoke like someone with authority from the Old Testament, a prophet, and said judgment was coming and you need to change your behavior. He didn't say light things, he told people the truth. You disgust me. How can you live with yourself? You sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> You stink. He wasn't living next to the temple with uh, fancy robes and this incredible religious experience where you'd go with horns blow and you smell beautiful fragrance. No, he's by a river in the wilderness eating bugs and yelling at people to change their ways. But what's crazy is the people responded to that. Yeah! John spoke of repentance, but he still didn't consider himself even worthy to tie the sandals of Jesus. He was just there to prepare the way for the Messiah. So how can Ji Gong and John the Baptist really compare? Ji Gong and John the Baptist both point out something in religions that is really important to catch, and that's if we don't pay attention, we can miss it. We can live in monasteries and temples, we can do the right things, we can dress to impress, but we can still fail to love the people around us. We can fail to see the homeless person outside and think that he's not worthy of the kingdom of God. We can fail to see someone who's drinking and say, he'll never be worthy of grace and mercy. We can get so lost in ceremony and ritual and imagine being a Pharisee and coming to the river and saying, I've been doing all the right things at the temple, I've been doing all of this, and these people didn't repent. And then here they come to this guy covered in camel hair who dunks them in some water and eats bugs and they listen. That reveals the heart, but offends the senses. People are not interested in a religion that doesn't relate to them and that they can't relate to. And that's one of the things that John the Baptist brought back to the Jewish people. He said, this is real. Stop cutting corners. You need to repent. And people realized that, that it wasn't about the religion and the ceremony. And he prepared the way for Jesus who would come, and really, Jesus would subvert everything. He would show a much deeper meaning behind scriptures, and he would show that they'd really missed the heart of God as a nation of Israel.
So I want to thank you for joining us at Pilgrimage Films. We would love it if you take some time and subscribe, like, comment, but also if you could just do one thing for us, just one thing, very small, right? Please share your favorite video on social media or with someone who'd like to see our stuff. And uh, we'd love to have a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. That's our goal. We have six months to do it and we need you as our A-team to help with that. But we're so grateful to have you as a community and for following us and watching us so far. Have you ever had an encounter that subverted your expectations? Have you ever judged somebody and then you find out, oh, that person's more righteous than I am? What's that like? Let us know in the comments below if you're brave enough. Anyways. We all know that the one who tried to subvert our expectations was Rian Johnson with episode eight. But it was like he just took all the things that Star Wars was and was like, I'm gonna do the opposite and people think I'm so smart. You're not smart, Rian Johnson. All you did was did the opposite of what people thought you'd do. And that's not like subverting your expectations. That's just being stupid, like a middle schooler who thinks he's smart because he's like, you're gonna think he's gonna live, but I'm gonna kill him. I am ranting about Star Wars.